as I see more and more people, uh, I'm getting more and more excited. <laughs> I'm quite anxious, I'm slightly anxious, excited. Um, you know, the thought of uh, having um, a table full of laureates up there. Uh, Horses in Weissel is, is one of the uh, laureates coming down. He's done a lot of work in the, in the visual cortex. Um, and there's a, there's a new idea that's recently come about, and that's the idea of um, some sort of visual prosthesis, maybe retinal implants. Um, so I'd certainly like to see what he, what he would think about the practicalities of that. If, if his advice to me is that you know, it's something that he, for good reason, believes is, um, is impractical, then maybe it's something that I wouldn't, I wouldn't follow. Uh, and here you can count these nuclear pore complexes on freeze fracturing and you, we know that there are about 2,000 to 3,000 of these nuclear pore complexes on the surface uh, of, uh, uh, of a nucleus. These little zip codes are able to open channels in the membrane so that the protein can go through a channel to the other side. It's Let me show you uh, now a, a model of how we think the pore complex is constructed and you see in the center here the 25 nanometer wide pore and if you rotate that yeah it does you can see now you can see the outer membrane the inner membrane the, and, and these little nodes serve as stocking sites and the signal sequence then tickles open the channel opens the channel and goes into the channel it's no less and no more to it I mean all the interaction between these proteins follow the law of chemistry that is these are molecules bumping, bumping into each other. And it has to be realized that the nuclei have all the genes, and the, and the transcription factors then bump into the genes, and when they, are, when they are recognized, they stick. And when they're not recognized, they fall off again, and they bump into another region. And then, I mean, it really requires also rather, uh, depend, all depend, how often they bump into in each other, it depends on the concentration. What about mathematics? Do you remember very much about how your mathematical ability developed? Because I think you have, I would say, more than the average chemist. Yeah, probably I had very early a tendency to, to count objects and to, to see how many there are and whether it's an even or an odd number of objects and whether one could divide them by two or by three, whether one can group them. I think these kind of thoughts I might have developed by myself. It's a fascinating toy which we always admired when we wanted to play with it, but we were only allowed to play with it on Sundays. On the weekdays we had to play with the wooden bricks and of course I mean all these magnificent books with all these tempting models which one could build up now, I mean that was really something which fascinated us. To be able to think in more than one, more than two, perhaps even more than three dimensions. <laughs> to think about all these possible arrangements, I mean, that's demanding and it, that needs a special uh, gift of imagination. Here we are coming now to the heart of our spectrometer where the real action is taking place, where the NMR experiment is being done. The nuclei, they are being excited by a radio frequency field which is being generated by these coils. The nuclei, they start to process like mad, sending out their signals again, and these signals are being recorded by the coils, and then the signals are fed back to the preamplifier, to the main amplifier, and finally going into the computer. And you have to imagine that all of that is inside of this very large superconducting magnet which is necessary to generate the magnetic field. This can happen only within a very strong magnetic field. Science is, is knowledge and knowledge is power and the question is what do you use the power for? That's where the political side comes in. I remember when the Russians uh, in, in the space race with the Americans put a little trapped vehicle on the moon. It was a beautiful thing. It moved along the surface of the moon. I had a letter from a constituent saying, Dear Tony, I see the Russians have put a trapped vehicle on the moon. Is there any prospect of a better bus service in Bristol? 
Now, that was a very, very good question. I mean, what do you use it for? And if you think of the money that's now spent on war, a fraction of that spent on AIDS or housing or education could revolutionise the world. Mine speaks in parables to the blind. Thine loves the same world that mine hath. Thy heaven's doors and my hell gates. Both read the Bible day and night. But thou reads black and I read white. You have a fondness for poetry. I use. I use poetry as a substitute for music. No, I have, I have no particular vocabulary of music in my head, but uh, I, I know thousands of lines of poetry that, that I can recall uh, as I like. The curious thing is uh, that uh, some pieces uh, I have known uh, for uh, 65 years or more. And uh, uh, when I record them, uh, I find uh, that I have sometimes improved them. <laughs> <laughs> By electronic structure, what we mean is the following. Uh, any sort of piece of matter, or any molecule for that matter, consists of nuclei and electrons. Nuclei are much heavier than the electrons. And so for a first approximation, one can assume that they move so slowly that they can be treated as momentarily stationary. And then the electrons move among these nuclei. And uh, this motion. Uh, leads to a kind of an equilibrium situation uh, of the electrons, and that is called electronic structure. Twenty-five, twenty-seven years ago, I was walking across my campus at the time, which was the San Diego campus of the University of California. It has a rather modest fountain on one of its plazas. And I was walking by that fountain and noticed a photographer uh, standing there, his uh, camera on a tripod, and uh, working on the camera. And there's a young woman who is carrying things for him. And he's uh, about to take a picture of this fountain. And uh, as I walked by, I'm a amateur photographer, uh, and I know some of the basic rules, and I see that the sun, which was not very high, must be shining <laughs> into his camera. And I feel, my God, he's taking this fairly seriously. And uh, should, I point, should I point that out to him? Yeah. Or should I just say, it's none of my business and <laughs> walk by? So I have this struggle of <laughs> conscience, right? <Yeah. laughs> so <laughs> conscience versus manners. And finally, conscience won. And I stopped and, <laughs> and I said, uh, excuse me, I, I know it's none of my business, but I just want to make sure that you've noticed that the sun may be shining on your lens. And uh, he did not really turn around to uh, uh, acknowledge my presence, but he just said, uh, thank you very much, and went right on with his business. Well, the next day I went to a seminar in another field in uh, uh, geophysics. And they had the most beautiful seminar room on the campus. And to my surprise, I see the same man coming in. And he is again taking some pictures of this seminar and the beautiful furnishings and, uh, and so on. So I leaned to my neighbor and said, tell me, who is this? And he says, oh, this is Ansel Adams, <laughs> <laughs> one of the great American <laughs> photographers, I think, yes. of, of all time. <laughs>